I've not done this presentation before, and I wrote it on the plane on the way here. Uh, so this is either going to be good and interesting, or terrible and embarrassing. Um, it's my job to be irritating. Uh, I'm quite lucky. I genuinely think, as an industry, we've hardly changed at all. Uh, I think we kind of obsess with the things that have changed rather than the things that haven't. Uh, so I like going on stages and trying to get people to think differently. So my job is to be more interesting than anything you can access on your phones right now. Uh, so I'm going to speak quite quickly. I'm going to be quite punchy. I'm going to be quite annoying. Um, hopefully I'm going to be nice. Hopefully you don't think I'm obnoxious and an idiot. Um, I want you all to think of the fastest cars in the world. I want you to imagine what a really, really fast car looks like. These are the four fastest cars in the world. They all do 0 to 60 in less than two and a half seconds. Um, I can't even remember what this one's called. I think it's a Porsche, incredibly expensive, nearly a million dollars, very low to the ground, very impractical. Uh, the next one, the Bugatti Veyron, even more expensive, two and a half million dollars. All of these cars are made by companies with over a hundred years of experience making cars. These people really know how to make a car. The next one, Le Ferrari, one and a half million dollars. But the very, very fastest car, and I'm sure some of you know this, is the Tesla. Uh, surprisingly realistic, um, surprisingly cheap, surprisingly spacious. You can fit golf clubs in the back. You buy it in entirely different ways. This is by a car company with less than eight years experience making cars. So what's going on? I think one of the things that's going on is they're challenging assumptions. Uh, someone like Tesla has no idea how to make a car. They don't know how it's supposed to be done. They don't have years of experts telling them that what they're doing is actually impossible. And I think there's something really essential in that essence that we need to think about. We are in an industry full of experts in a world which is increasingly irrelevant. So we need to think about our jobs differently. I'm sorry if this is annoying, but you know, hopefully there's something in this. Um, so I think we, we're seeing a lot of paradigm shifts in the world, whether it's commerce, whether it's retail, whether it's the way that we consume media, whether it's where we are, whether it's how we do our jobs. And I think it's important to understand the degree to which things are changing and are not changing. I think we need to be careful about the assumptions we keep. We, we make assumptions like people won't pay for content. We make assumptions um, like... CPMs when things are streamed are always going to be lower. Like we fix our head with these assumptions, which are sometimes helpful and limiting, and are sometimes the product of expertise, and sometimes they're incredibly destructive and unhelpful. Um, so I do this by provoking a debate. So I go to quite a few different places and, and talk, um, and I do so because I know I'm not right. Um, but I've got really fed up of everyone saying exactly the same stuff on stage. I've got fed up with everyone saying, yes, more data is good, rather than saying, well, actually, like, why do we need all this data? I've got fed up with people saying that programmatic is definitely a bad thing because it's deflationary, when actually it could just mean a smarter way to do things. So I say things that are quite provocative to hopefully bring about a debate where I can learn and hopefully other people can as well. Uh, so I write for quite a lot of places. Uh, the Economist, Entrepreneur, The Guardian, Wired, CNBC. Um, and the quote on the right-hand side is my kind of claim to fame quote. So I wrote this a few years ago, uh, and it's what's kind of allowed me to have a bit of a platform. But anyway, there are lots of assumptions. We still have QWERTY keyboards on our phones. The latest iPhone 7 has one. The reason we have a QWERTY keyboard is because in typewriters, the mechanical arms used to clash into each other. Uh, so to design around that, we made sure that the letters were placed in a way which meant that infrequently used letters were next to each other. I'm not saying it's a terrible way for a keyboard to be designed, but it's interesting we haven't challenged that. It's interesting we haven't changed it. It's kind of funny to think about media. So the very first TV shows were just plays with cameras pointed at them. The very first radio shows were just people reading out newspaper articles. This was not a terrible way to make TV shows. But it was weird that no one thought that there was this new thing which allowed new things to happen. And I think we're full of that. Uh, so in advertising, I don't think we've changed. And I think we've got four kind of killer assumptions um, that are really ruining our ability to make progress. So the next part of the presentation 
is, is two parts. I'm going to talk about four assumptions, which is a slightly negative in notion. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about eight amazing possibilities. And then I'm hoping that I say enough stuff that you want to ask me questions uh, so there'll be like a reasonably decent Q&A session at the end. But these four deadly assumptions, the first one is to repurpose the old. Um, so we've taken TV ads from the 1950s and 60s and we've sort of rendered them out with a codec and stuck them on YouTube and then really felt like we got it. Like most people now who do digital pre-roll feel like they're doing something quite contemporary and new when in fact we've essentially changed nothing. Um, the, the ad from the left is from the 1820s, the ad from the right is from last week. Even the most contemporary, most sexy, most glamorous, most sophisticated uh, social media advertising that we do today still looks remarkably similar to something from over 150 years ago. Um, we do it everywhere, so the website on the right is how you buy a, a baseball glove, I think they're called, mitt, a baseball thing. That's how you buy them today. And on the left-hand side is how you bought them 200 years ago. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong that websites look like this. I'm just raising the question that it's interesting that not much has changed. Uh, even newspapers today largely look uh, like digital equivalents of the past. So generally speaking in advertising, we've taken what we've done before and we've kind of rendered it out to new production specs. And I think that's a bit of a wasted opportunity. Um, and how we've done that generally is to reduce around the limitations of the new. Uh, so the primary media in our lives in the kind of 1800s was the cinema, where we'd go and see a huge screen. We'd sit really far back from it with lots and lots of people, and we'd have no interactivity with it whatsoever. Your choice was to be there or to not be there. Um, then we had the TV. So a smaller number of people sitting closer to a smaller screen with a greater chance to interact with it. Then we had the laptop, fewer people, happier people. Uh, closer to it, smaller screen again, with way more interactivity. So now you can kind of completely control your entire viewing experience. You can watch anything at any point in time, anywhere in the entire world. And then the kind of next, and for the moment, the kind of final destination on this journey is the mobile phone. So on the one hand, this is the most personal, most tactile, most immersive, most interactive screen we've ever known, but it's also the smallest screen. And what we've tended to do so far is to take what we've done before and just reduce it around the limitations rather than realizing these incredible things that you can now do. Like to have a, a, a screen which can three-dimensionally render out things that make you feel immersed is quite incredible. To have a device that knows where you're planning on being later on that day is remarkable. To have something that can tell how stressed you are from the way that you're speaking on phone calls is everything you'd ever dream about in advertising. But so far, we've only tended to, to reduce things around the new limitations of these devices. Uh, interestingly, virtual reality could, and I do mean could, could be the next point on this journey, even closer to us, even more personal, even more immersive, but that's for another day. Um, assumption three is that sort of TV is TV. And this doesn't make much sense, but my point is we know that this person is watching TV. Uh, we know that this person is watching TV. Uh, we know that they're watching TV. He probably is watching TV, but it's kind of different because it's a computer. Um, they're kind of watching TV, but it's kind of different because it's a tablet. Um, I'm not sure if she's watching TV. Uh, <laughs> maybe he's watching TV. Um, like, we don't really know what TV is anymore. I know this sounds a bit weird, um, and it makes me feel quite vulnerable saying this in front of all of you, but as someone that works at a media agency, I don't know what TV is. Um, and we will endlessly go around conferences talking about TV is dead or TV is amazing. But I don't think we know what it is anymore. Like it used to be labeled after a single purpose device with an entire vertically integrated supply production line, TV stations on a, you know, making TV shows from TV production companies through TV channels that were brought to you from TV transmitters over TV waves. 
And now we don't know what it means. Like, uh, is it still linked to the screen? Like, if I watch a TV show on my phone, does it magically not become TV? Uh, is it the context for consumption? Is there something about being in a living room and sitting back which makes it TV? Um, is it to do with the delivery mechanism? Does, does a TV show stop being a TV show if it's brought to me by the internet? Like, is direct TV now a TV? Is, is Netflix TV? What's the difference? Uh, is it to do with the show length? Like, if I watch uh, the highlights of Jimmy Fallon and it only takes eight minutes, does that stop being TV? Uh, is it the quality? Like, if I watch something terrible uh, from, like, a local news station, does that suddenly stop being TV? There's quite a lot of confusion here about what TV is. And I think we should probably talk about that at some point. Um, because that's like our entire industry. Um, but I think there are particular moments where it really comes home to me how vague this is. Like if I am watching DirecTV now on my phone, I really don't know if I'm watching TV. Um, if I'm watching Facebook Live, I know that that's not TV. Um, if I'm watching the, an episode of the OA and it takes like one hour and 27 minutes, like when does TV become a movie? I think all of these lines are blurring and we should probably have some conversations about that. Um, especially because there will be people measuring this stuff. Like we keep on seeing projections into the future about what the media spend on mobile will be, what it will be on non-mobile digital, what it will be on TV. And if we're going to spend a lot of money and a lot of effort figuring out what the values of these things are, we should probably at least define them first. Otherwise, we'll look quite silly. Um, the fourth assumption is that streaming is somehow a bad thing. Um, as an industry, we tend to sort of take off our human being heads and put on our marketing head when we come into work every day. And therefore, we think in a very different way. Um, if you were to sort of wake up in the middle of the night and uh, your partner or, or sons or whatever were on their phone buying something from Amazon, if you said, what are you doing? They probably wouldn't say, I'm doing e-commerce. They would just say they're buying something. Um, if, if, you, if they were on like a banking app and you said, what are you doing? They wouldn't say, I'm doing mobile banking. They'd say, I'm just trying to pay someone some money. Um, similarly with data. Like, unless you're abroad, you in no way care where your data comes from. You don't care if it's 4G. You don't care if it's cellular, if it's Wi-Fi based. Uh, if you buy something from Amazon, you don't care if it's UPS or FedEx or DHL that delivers it to you. Generally speaking, in life, we have no interest whatsoever in how things get to us. But as an industry, we're totally paralyzed by it. And I find that quite confusing. Um, because, again, as, as someone who works for a media agency, I have no idea when I'm streaming. If I'm watching Netflix, I think I'm probably streaming. If I live pause uh, something on Fios, I don't know if that magically becomes streaming anymore. I have absolutely no idea what SVOD, what AVOD, what VOD, what time shifting means anymore. All of these lines are blurring. But I do know that it's a very positive thing. I think as an industry, if we can stop worrying about things which are not necessarily that important to people and instead fo focus on the new opportunities, then I think some really exciting things can happen. Somehow, I mean, I kind of know why it is, but somehow as an industry, we've got into our heads that streaming is somehow bad. We've got it into our heads that it becomes video and the rates for video are lower than the rates for TV. I think we need to be sort of mindful that that's a slightly strange assumption to make. Uh, especially because in the world of 5G, increasingly the way that everything gets to us, I believe, will be through some digital mechanism. Whether it's wired broadband, whether it's 5G wireless broadband, it seems highly unlikely to me that by 2020 or 2022, uh, the, the primary way that people will get stuff will still be over the TV air. So the next thing is the eight possibilities for the kind of post-digital TV landscape. Um, so the first one is abundance. I find it impossible to believe that there's not going to be more TV. We just may have to think about what it is in a different way. But I think that more people will watch it more often in more places, in more countries than ever. If you make great quality stuff, this will be the best time you could ever hope for. Again, how it gets to people, who cares? Uh, the second thing is precision. Um, 
For years, we've bought content as the proxy for the people. You want to buy people interested in cars, you buy a motoring show. Um, the delivery of all television and video over the, air, over the internet will allow you to buy much more precisely. Whether you're buying audiences, whether you're buying specific people, whether you're buying contexts, whether you're buying moments, everything can now be done differently. If you are a luxury handbag maker and you know that only one in 10,000 people can afford your handbag, you are still able to buy ads this way. Um, if you are an osteoporosis um, drugs manufacturer, you no longer have to blanket buy shows that you think people will be watching. You can target specifically people that might have searched for this. It's genuinely an incredibly exciting and profound thing, but somehow as an industry, we've hidden away from it because we're kind of worried about entering this territory of programmatic and video rather than TV. Linked to this is this idea of relevance. Uh, you will now, well, sh one day you will be able to buy ads that are inserted in real time. Uh, so you'll be able to buy against current events or trending topics. You'll be able to make ads and serve ads that are dynamically created based on those real time conditions. You will be able to get completely personalized ads. There, there are lots and lots of discussions about this to do with privacy concerns. And that's an interesting conversation for people to have at events like this. But there is certainly the technical possibility to serve much more personalized, much more relevant ads. And generally speaking, we assume that things that are hyper-personal will freak people out. But a lot of this depends on how it's done. If you ask people if, if they're happy for Google to keep their data, about 70% of people say no. If you ask them if they'd like their search results to be personalized, about 75% of people say yes. So a lot of this is about the um, wording that we use to explain this. And ads will become optimized. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the fourth thing is ads can now be centered around people rather than channels. Um, we will be able to buy ads that cross screens, so buy against people wherever they happen to be uh, watching. Um, they will tend to move to places which are better for people to interact. Like the TV screen is not a great place for people to interact. Uh, the mobile, the tablet, the laptop are far easier. So there's no reason why ads can't be served to ensure that most calls to action happen on more interactive devices. And ads will work around people rather than frequency. So there won't necessarily be the need to do frequency capping in the same way we do it today. We'll be able to very accurately track who's seen what, how much of it they watched, how long they watched it for, and even how they responded to it. Um, a, a building on that, it will then be possible to kind of take ads that build experiences over time. So ads that can be served sequentially. We'll be able to undertake campaigns that move from branding and push people down the funnel to performance marketing. If, uh, again, we, we make a lot of assumptions in this industry. Because we can so accurately measure everything on, on the digital platform at the moment, we tend to assume that's the best place to do performance marketing and not branding. Increasingly, as everything becomes digital, that assumption will no longer keep. So number six of these eight, uh, we'll obviously then be able to get real-time performance data. We'll be able to see what's working in real time. We'll probably be able to get more data on how people are responding. It, it might be something as weird as facial expressions, but probably not. It might just be how long people looked at things for, uh, what they then went on to do afterwards. And this measurement will be more accurate than ever. Um, there will be a whole new array of interactive options. Uh, for some reason, we've always assumed that on digital ads, a click was the thing that people would do, and the click would take someone to a website where they could do something else. There is no reason why, whether it's through voice recognition, whether it's through gesture control, whether it's through t like linking up with another screen that you have in front of you, that we may not find completely different calls to action whether it's asking Uber to get us a cab to that location, whether it's saving something to our calendar, whether it's sending a coupon to our best friend to get money off. There's like a whole array of new forms of interactions that are possible. And the final one is just about power. Um, I have no idea why it is that a TV ad is 30 seconds long. 
Um, I presume there's probably some historical reason to do with tape lengths or something. I presume there must be some fundamental unit. Uh, but increasingly, as the majority of the things that we watch become shorter, I think it's highly likely that we'll frame advertising in a different way. So rather than assuming that things should be 60 seconds or 30 seconds, and assuming that we run one bit of creative enough times for people to see it before following up with a second piece of creative, we can now start doing things like serving eight second long TV ads that build sequentially over the day or over the week to tell a much richer story that people have a greater chance of watching. Um, so I know all this stuff is a little bit um, out there, and it makes me feel a bit naive saying this stuff. Um, but I think, generally speaking, this kind of creates a whole new canvas for us to think about. I think if we were to start our jobs not so much um, with how things have been done before, and more as a naive, interesting, smart person that has come to this planet today, I think we would probably make incredibly exciting new advertising experiences. Um, so I'm kind of here partly um, to, to bring about that debate and hopefully to sort of inspire an industry to think about these things differently and to stop these kind of assumptions and this muscle memory. Because I think if we think of these screens, the ability to tell stories, the ability to have an audience that's quite relaxed and be looking to be entertained, if we think about the value of sound, all of those things together probably create the best canvas we've ever known for advertising. And this is probably the best time to work in an industry that needs to kind of embrace the power of the new. I think I'm out of time, but maybe I can do one more, or maybe not. No. 